Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to worship today. And uh, the announcements for today, there's one announcement. We will be worshiping at the lake, uh, Shalbina Lake, uh, next week at 10 a.m., both Shalbina and the Honeywell Methodist Churches. We're at the Shelter House. I believe it is Shelter House 3, the one by the amphitheater. It has a uh, pavilion and it has a bathroom. And um, so please come uh, at 10 a.m. We'll uh, worship together and then we will uh, have a few moments for some... I, I, I'm going to invite people to get into some groups and, and answer a few questions that I need to know for the future of how we, we handle the fall in 2021 because, yeah, I need to know some things what y'all are thinking. And, and I didn't realize that one detail, um, we will have, there'll be play equipment there, playground equipment, and I don't think it would be wise at this time to have a bunch of our children playing on the same playground equipment. So I, I will ask, um, please keep your kids to, with your, your family unit, unit. We don't, we won't need masks as we're outside, but we will need to continue to do social distancing because, well, you know, 2020, Good times. The reading this day comes from Ephesians 6. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you might be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 2017, Pope Francis proposed changing the translation of the Lord's Prayer. This part that we're looking at, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That, that's our focus today, right? Pope Francis proposed that instead we should say, lead us not into temptation. That, that, that didn't get at what was going on, right? That the, he didn't want to get the sense that a father was leading us into temptation. And so he proposed that we instead say, do not let us fall into temptation. Okay, right? That does, that does get at the sense that uh, uh, Heavenly Father would not intend to purposely do something wrong, and that temptation, in, in the English context, the English language, temptation is always wrong, but, uh, always a bad thing. And, and so, that, okay, that, that would be a way to, to understand and translate that. But uh, that does also get at the fact that here at the end of the Lord's Prayer is the one place where there are some interesting translation issues. There are some challenges around that, right? Because what, what Pope Francis is trying to dodge is the way that temptation is always a negative in English. So, do not let us fall into temptation. In the biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek, that word for temptation, which is also the, the word for testing, is not always negative, right? It is always evil to tempt someone in, in, in English, but to test or to tempt someone in Hebrew or Greek, sometimes that's a very good thing. In Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 2, we read of how the Lord was testing, tempting the people to help them grow and mature, testing and tempting as part of the way that a father raises children as they needed to learn the ways to follow God, follow the Ten Commandments, follow the Torah as they made their way across the desert. We read in James in the New Testament, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, tests, temptations of any kind. Consider it nothing but joy, for you know that such testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you might be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And so dealing with temptation and trials is part of growing up. It's part of maturing as a disciple of Jesus. It's not evil. It, it's, it sometimes can have bad results. Sometimes it has good results, but it's part of the process. We look at Jesus with his disciples, and they are tested, they are tempted when they go across the waters, and Jesus falls asleep in the front of the boat, and a storm comes, and Jesus challenges them, don't you believe what is going on here? 
Right? We know that Jesus himself was tested and tempted in every way that we are. The book of Hebrews tells us this. And so in the biblical languages, in the biblical context, temptation is not inherently evil. It's more like a, a test to see where you stand. It's like testing your steak to see whether it's properly done. The answer being, is it medium rare? Which is the way steak is done. So in, in the sense of trying to translate this properly, it would be something like, don't let me be tested or tempted such that I am not able to be faithful. Don't let me be tested or tempted so that I would not be able to stay faithful to you, Lord. There's a proverb, it is in Proverbs of, uh, chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, that has this exact same sense, and that has always stuck with me. The proverb is, Lord, let me not, neither be too rich that I might have as much as I could ever need and deny you. And do not let me be too poor that I would have to steal bread and profane your name, right? Lord, don't, don't let me have, don't let, don't let me fall into this place of temptation so that I'm so rich I deny you, or that I'm so poor that, that I, I steal and go astray. All right, just keep me in, in the place. Don't let me be so tempted, so tested that I fall astray. Okay. I pray that. I believe that. Lord, don't let me be tempted such that I fall astray. Yeah, that, that's good. Right? The harder verse to get, get our minds around then is this verse when we're talking about evil. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so first we have to talk, decide what exactly we think it says. Because you could translate this, deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. It's this exact same grammar, exact same word. It can mean, that means either one, right? If you're picking out someone in a, in a line of people and you say, which one? You could say the short one or the shortest or short, right? The shorty, right? It, well, however you want to phrase it, like in, in English, we would say the short one, but in Greek, you could just say the short and, and the, the one is implied. Um, or the tallest, like it, it, it works with all, all throughout all aspects of the, the Greek language, right? So this could be deliver us from evil. It can also equally be deliver us from the evil one, or it could mean both simultaneously. That it's an implied and assumed and useful ambiguity in, in the language, and we we can't look at things like. In English, if it's a, something's a proper noun, there's a we capitalize the first letter. Well, capitals hadn't been invented for in, at, when the uh, the Bible was being written. It'd be another 200 years down the road, and so it's not even like we could say, well, is it a capital E as an evil one, or, or is it lowercase e? Well. We don't know. And it's, the Bible itself it has different ways of, of understanding evil. And in the, in the Old Testament, the Satan is a job title for the tempter, the angel whose job it is to tempt or, or accuse. Whereas in the New Testament, the language has shifted. So the Satan, it no longer is the Satan, it's just Satan. It becomes a, a name. And so evil has become more of a personified thing. And so either way, uh, deliver us from evil, deliver us from the evil one. What is obvious, what is agreed between the two is that evil is real. And we're not going to be able to clear up the nature of Satan from this verse. That's another sermon. But evil is real, right? Evil is real. Deliver us from evil means that there is evil that we need to be delivered from. And this is something that Paul reminds us of. In Ephesians 6, he tells the church at Ephesus, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power, putting on the whole armor of God, so that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the comic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you might be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. And this puts us in a kind of an odd place. 
because we are saying as christians we are saying this is the word of god for us the people of god thanks be to god right this is the word of god that we are struggling with the power the cosmic powers of this present darkness and we know that as we join the church right to join the methodist church to be baptized into the christian faith in the methodist church the vows are do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin right? do you resist evil injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves the language there is obviously inspired by, by Paul. Right? And so we have this clear sense that there is a very real evil in the world, and yet I don't get the sense that I am in, like, in conflict with evil on a regular basis. Like when I open my planner and I look at my week, it's not like, oh, Wednesday at 2 o'clock. I have from 2 to 3.30, struggle with the cosmic powers of darkness. And then run and get the mail. Like, it, I don't have a feeling like I'm grappling with evil on a regular basis. And the person who helped me best understood how evil can be so very pedestrian is a fellow by the name of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters that talks of, it, it, the Screwtape Letters are a set of letters from a senior devil to a junior devil, where the senior devil ex is explaining to the junior devil how best to tempt people, how to tempt them away from Jesus and towards Satan and, and towards evil. And, and uh, it, it's a book that I have, it, it's been fascinating to me because it helps us understand the nature of temptation and how it works and how just simply pedestrian it can be and i would read the, so these letters to you directly out of my copy of the book but i've loaned it out and i realized i can't find it anymore i don't know who i, who I loaned it to and so you'll have, we'll have to go on my memory of it but these are the two letters i wanted to read to you and here are my paraphrases of them right so the first letter a senior devil is advising a junior devil to lead an older woman astray by leading her into the sin of gluttony. Now, gluttony is usually understood to be the sin of not being satisfied, like having a table, a vast array of food, and eating it all and not being satisfied. Having all you could have, ever want and not being satisfied with, with, with having it. And the senior devil says it is far easier to get someone to gluttony, not with abundance, but with well, a cup of tea. You see, if you, the senior devil advises the junior devil, if you can tempt this lady to see her afternoon cup of tea and see that it is never quite strong enough, unless it's made too strong and then it's bitter, right? and it's never quite strong enough, right? And, and then the, the tea isn't quite the right flavor anymore, not like in the good old days, how it used to be, and that the, the slice of toast that comes with her tea, that the slice of toast is, is either overcooked and too crispy and it's not soft in the middle, or there's not enough butter spread upon it, or that uh, the butter wasn't spread on it soon enough, and so uh, the uh, so the butter didn't all melt and there was not enough jam to go with butter. And you get the sense of it, right? That if you can help this, if you can lead this lady down a path to see every aspect of what used to bring her joy, what used to bring her satisfaction, what used to be the way that she bound her life together with others, having this, this like afternoon tea with people, what used to be a source of real joy, if you can just like pick away at that until she is never satisfied with it because it's never as good as it used to be and she just just nitpicks everything about it that that is the way to lead her away from what is good and true and i remember reading that and putting the book down and thinking whoo he got me there right the other letter that has really stuck with me is the one about how to tempt this lady's uh, son, this younger son, who is a grown man, and how the way to tempt him is to fill his life with noise, fill his life with distraction, with news and goings on and the latest everything, and just keep his life so full of all of this distraction and noise such that he never has a moment of silence in which he might ponder what is true or end up being bored and then end up looking in himself 
and see where he stands and have an increased level of self-awareness, which might lead to repentance, right? And sin and grappling and turning towards Christ. But keep this man's life so full of noise that he neither has uh, silence nor does he have music. Because music might inspire and lead him to what is beautiful and true and good in another way. Right? These are the types of pedestrian evil that I think are far more common in our lives. I think of them as I think of the way that uh, our news today... And I'm not sp speaking of any particular news, like CBS, CNN, Fox, like you pick any of the letters, any of the designations, I'm purposely trying not to remember all of them because I'll forget one, just like all the sources of news. They are all, as a whole, set up to give us news all day. That there's always something going on. And that always something is going on. There's always conflict. It's always national conflict. It's always something that is, is outside of our control, disconnected from our life here in Shelby County, almost always. And, um, and it ends up getting us wrought up, up about them, about the, what is happening. And, and so we end up wrought up and disconnected, full of this noise and incapable of having silence. Because there's always something else to check. Or taking the time to listen to music, right, and be inspired by something good and true and beautiful. And, and so we end up living these, we're tempted towards living these lives that are overwrought, right? And we, we get disconnected from the Prince of Peace who tells us that his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and that he gives us a peace that passes understanding if we but accept it. Right? And we get disconnected from the fact that, like right now, we are part of 75 million people that are worshiping in America on a Sunday morning. 75 million people have taken a Sunday morning to have a few moments of silence and sing and have a few moments of joy directed towards the source of all that is true and beautiful and good. And another aspect of the media we consume is not just the way that it creates noise and distraction, is also the speed at which it moves. If we look at the speed at which media moves, news cycles are now shorter than a day. It can be an afternoon news cycle. TV dramas can solve any crime in 44 minutes, and movies can bring two people and have them fall in love in an hour and a half or two hours, whatever it is. Right? We have a peace that passes understanding, and we need that peace, for we follow a Lord whose time frame is far longer than the media would have us think through, right? Following Jesus is not about this sort of new cycle speed of thought in life. It is about a slower rhythm of life. Right? Paul uh, tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 that... We are sent forth as ambassadors of reconciliation. And to be ambassadors is to take the responsibility to go to people that we disagree with, to go to people that we are at odds with, and to sit down and to give them time. And it's going to take more than 44 minutes or an hour and a half to be an ambassador of reconciliation, to be an envoy of the Prince of Peace. Right? To, be, to, to, to sort of be peaceable people and, and to control how we engage with the media is not to ignore what is wrong and broken. It is not to be so rushed by it so that we panic and we respond out of, without having a sense that we follow the Prince of Peace and that we need to act. And we are called to act in ways that are in line with the peaceful nature of who Jesus is. Right, we have the time to be peaceful and patient. It may be that to resist temptation and to avoid evil, whether it is pedestrian or grand evil, is rooted in such practices as taking joy in what it is that we have, not allowing uh, ourselves to nitpick things to death, and, and instead being able to accept what we are given as a gift from a good God, and not being sucked into distraction and noise in the timelines of our modern media such that we aren't able to find time for silence, for music, for patient and kind conversation. It might be that in taking time for these things and taking time for joy this week and taking time for silence that we are, this is how we line up our lives with what it is that we pray. We, when we pray, lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. Amen. Please bow your heads with me and let us pray. Lord, this bit of the Lord's Prayer is a bit challenging, we must acknowledge. For in doing and praying this part, we, we acknowledge that we are tested and tempted by life. And so we pray that the trials that come to us may test us without derailing us, strengthen us without leading us astray, and that we might be delivered from the evil that we engage in our lives. That even if it is the pedestrian evil, that we might reject it. We might reject what leads us towards joyless, tense lives and instead slow down and find the joy of being a people of your peace, of your calm, and of commitment to your kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. And may now the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.